everyone to a book talk featuring uh, the Reverend Jim Burklow, Associate Dean of Religious Life here at the University of California. And we are going to talk about his new book, which we will be selling after our, our talk. Uh, it's called Soldier. And um, I have to say, uh, Jim is incredibly prolific. It just seems like every year he's releasing a book. Um, and uh, for those of us who spend years trying to put out our first book, uh, it's a little daunting to see how quickly he turns them out. But this particular book took seven years to write. It's been a labor of love. It's been something that he's worked on uh, in his own mind uh, for a long time. It's really a culmination of a, a lifetime of experiences with other faith traditions. And um, it's his first work of fiction, so that's something unique as well. So the way I thought we would do it today is I would have an informal conversation with Jim about the book, then we'll open it up for a bigger conversation with all of you, and then we can break for a book sale and have some cookies and all that. Um, so congratulations on Soldier. Thank you. It's a big deal. Um, and uh, I think, I guess what I want to start off by asking you is, <clears throat> you went on your own Soldier to write this book. Seven years, uh, a lot of uh, experiences that you've had are in the book, uh, and it's your first work of fiction. <coughs> so tell me about the process of writing this book, about writing fiction, where the idea came from, and uh, how it all came together. Well, the, the idea for this came out of uh, actually being a pastor and also a campus minister at Stanford. Yeah. And uh, you know we live in a, certainly in a state, uh, if not a country, <coughs> where uh, religious diversity is just increasing constantly, every kind of religious diversity. <coughs> Excuse me, I'll be fine. Um, so that's diversity of different faith traditions, but also diversity within them. And I've also always had a personal fascination with this going back to uh, high school. <coughs> what happened is I, uh, I met this gentleman, he was a furniture salesman, a man who sold furniture out of the out of the back of his car, didn't keep the furniture there, kept the catalogs. Anyway, he was selling furniture to my parents, and uh, he was just a very chatty fellow, he's very good at sales, which involves a personal connection. So next thing I know, uh, he's interviewing me, and saying, and who are you, young man? I was 16 years old. And uh, he, he asked questions, and I was a person who was, you know, deeply, very much on a spiritual journey, and uh, Christian, but also, you know, not comfortable with kind of orthodox, dogmatic Christianity. I never was. And yet I was a very devout and spiritually focused kind of person. Anyway, he hears me, and at the end of the conversation, says, you are one of us. And I go, Okay, who's us? And he goes, he goes, uh, spiritual, spiritually centered people who care about social justice. There's a whole world of them. Here's the reading list. And he proceeded to write out a reading list, which included Gandhi's autobiography, the autobiography of John Woolman, who was a Quaker, colonial Quaker, amazing story. Beautiful, one of the most beautiful pieces of, you know, writing of uh, spirituality in history. Uh, the Dhammapada of Buddha, and uh, the, the letters of Dr. King, Martin Luther King, and more. And so by age 18, I'd read all this and uh, was on my path. And I realized that I'm a Christian, but I'm totally open to other religions. I, I never could accept the idea that Christianity was the only true faith. So, it's, so this, the interest in all this goes way back. <laughs> Uh, but I got really interested in America's homegrown religions uh, in the last 10 years. I just started on a reading jag of my own about that, which is just fascinating. So all this came together, and then I, I, I wrote a novel when I was 30. Well, I'd always want, I've been writing a novel since I was 16 years old, but I finally finished it when I was 30. But uh, thank God I didn't publish that novel. It was just terrible. Uh, <laughs> so it you know, took some, some more... Uh, seasoning, shall we say, to be able to write something that you can feel good about being prime. So all these things came together, but uh, seven years ago, in the context of being a pastor of the church, where I was, I was teaching Sunday school, and I, I organized a Sunday school program, I wanted it to be interfaith. And so I took my seventh and eighth graders on, on soldier in San Francisco. That's when the soldier thing got going. And uh, that was so much fun. The parents wanted to they were excited about this. That's, I'm going to do a novel about that. So that's how we 
But I would, this thing wouldn't happen without you, Jerry, and uh, Timothy here uh, being such a supportive environment to, to do this stuff. So, so thanks to the Office of Religious Life wow. for supporting. And this book is really about religion in America. It's about Joshua T. Stoneburner who travels around his um, native land of southern Arizona and visits different houses of worship. So really what you're doing is you're revealing a unique and changing American landscape that represents all of the faith traditions of the world. And as you say, no matter where you live in the United States, within 100 miles, you can hit houses of worship from every major faith tradition. And that's what the protagonist does. So what does religion mean for America, and what does America mean for religion? Well, yeah, it, it's, I think America does something to the world's religions as they land on our shores. And, and the world's religions do something to America. And we had a wonderful member of Phil Goldberg came a few years ago yeah. uh, here on camp. We, were, yeah. we brought him a wonderful man who uh, wrote a book called American Veda, which is all about the uh, influence of the Vedic religions on the United States, going all the way back to the time of Emerson and Thoreau, uh, when the translations of the Vedic texts first became available in English and German. And what a powerful effect that had on the culture, um, even before there were any Hindus here to speak of, or, or Buddhists, or any of the other traditions. But, but the influence of that was powerful in the beginning. So, but but then there's a certain way that America does religion, you know, and then that begins to influence how uh, uh, the world's religions manifest when they get here, and, and that's a theme of this book. Uh, which you know, I, there's humor in this book, and there you know, there's there's something charming and, and even comical at some points about how uh, uh, religion, the world's religions, come here and they have to deal with America's culture and they acculturate, and uh, and so for instance, Buddhism in the United States, uh, before a lot of Buddhists came, that was a result of the 1965 immigration reform. Uh, before people from Buddhist countries came here in any big numbers, you had uh, uh, beatnik Buddhism, right? And so that has spread across the country ahead of people from Buddhist countries, right? So it's this interesting interplay of an Americanized version of Buddhism that predates the arrival of the homegrown Buddhists from Buddhist countries. Same with Hinduism, yes, as you know so yeah. well. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you told a great story about your, you know, your own story yeah. of, uh, you know, being a Hindu showing up at the Hare Krishna temple because that's the one that's local <laughs> and it's run by a bunch of white hippies, you know, <laughs> and, and then the actual Hindus from India show up and who are they dealing with? It's just, it's, there's a lot of, you know, there's some humor here and that's woven into the book. And then America's homegrown religions, which has spread all the world. And, uh, and, and had a powerful cultural impact elsewhere. Uh, the, their story of origins in this country is fascinating. So that part of the, the fun for me of writing the book was weaving the story, those stories together, mushing them together, mashing it up, and uh, seeing the similarities and the differences, and, and how learning about one religion helps you learn about another, and also about your own. And you begin to ask questions that you wouldn't have asked except that you had these encounters with people of other of widely different faiths. So that's that's the gist of it. Uh, religion in the United States. Interfaith or interfaith? So in other words, yeah. is it super or is it solid? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it is it uh, you know, run through the blender and turned into kind of a uh, um, yeah, we wrestle with this, yes, in our office. Yeah. So we think about this issue because it, it affects our work in a big way. And uh, I think it's both, isn't it? I mean, we've got, we have soup and salad. Yeah. You know, we have, so we've got, um, the statistics on this are really interesting. Uh, uh, we, we both read a book together called American Grace, and it's about the sociology of religion and the trends in religion in the United States. There's a very powerful trend towards what's called heterodoxy. So that's where a person who says they're evangelical Christian, 56% of them now, uh, for one thing, believe that other religions can be as salvific for others as theirs is for them, which is an amazing statistic. But 
There's, uh, there's something like 26% of evangelicals in America now believe in reincarnation. Yeah. And they are not hearing that from the pulpit of their church that they go to. So there's, you know, people's belief systems are all mashed up and mushed in this country more and more. And, uh, and that's part of the, that comes out of the book too. But that's, that's where you go interfaith, yeah? yeah? As opposed to interfaith, interfaith, which is more of a salad where it's like, You've got your religion, you've got yours, you've got yours. We all hopefully work in harmony together and have good relationships, but we're all different. That's what, that's existing alongside this whole culture of, uh, of, uh, of mashing it up. And, uh, what is it, like a third or a half of our interfaith council students here have no religious affiliation, but they love being at the interfaith council. <laughs> so it's... Uh, both are true. So you've been doing work with college students um, for 30 years. You're at Stanford before you were here, and you've seen generational shifts. What characterizes this generation of college students in terms of their, their approach to religious life? And how can this book be a template or a guide for them? Well, my hope is that this book is a conversation starter. Uh, it's you know it's about a young adult, so hopefully it will reach that audience. I think you know my intent was this for this to be read by a very wide range of ages, from fourteen to ninety-four. But but I would very much like I really hope that it gets used as a conversation starter in dormitories, and classrooms, and living rooms, and churches, temples, and mosques. Starbucks all over the country um, as a way of getting people to think about um, what it means to live in a, you know what um, yeah what it means to live in the most religiously diverse nation on the planet what's that mean um, what what uh, wonderful things can be gained from being exposed to that diversity uh, to get people curious like okay there's a Gurdwara up the street from me. Have I ever been to the Gurdwara? Maybe it's time to go, you know? Because that's what Josh does. Josh is a kid. He's a kid with very little inhibition, which gets him into comical trouble in the book. And part of his lack of inhibition is a lack of inhibition about showing up at places where nobody invited him. And, uh, and so he goes. And uh, stuff happens. And, and, and in the book, you see that he's welcomed with open arms everywhere he goes, which is pretty much what happens when you go on your own soul journey. Surprise, surprise, you know, it's a rare day that a religious community is going to turn you away or shun you. Or, that just doesn't happen much in our experience here. You'll see that certainly in the church. We do the same kind of thing. We do soul journeys with our students. You know, it's a house to worship around all day. Everybody loves us. Yeah. This book is set in Arizona, and you take students to Southern Arizona every uh, spring break for an alternative spring break trip. Um, you, I think, gravitate towards the desert. It's sort of a spiritual home. Uh, we are hosting an exhibition that you arranged from the migrants of Southern Arizona. Why Southern Arizona? Well, I, I think it's, uh, I really love, it. have you guys seen the, the movie Lawrence of Arabia? Mm -hmm. There's a great passage in Lawrence of Arabia where uh, Lawrence comes in after his desert campaign in Saudi Arabia and he's just filthy dirty and he's, you know, he comes up to the bar at the, at the, uh, the barracks in Cairo, bellies up to the bar there with his uh, uh, Arab robes on and his filth all over him. And a, a British officer, primly dressed, says, Lawrence, why do you like, why do you like the desert so much? And his answer was, it's, it's clean. <laughs> and I love that answer because it is. It's like it's a place where you, uh, um, your imagination runs free and you are um, liberate. It's liberating. It's spiritually liberating and clean place. Uh, you look without, outside, and it invites you to look within. And it invites you to recognize your puny place in the cosmos and it puts you in your place and it, and it cleanses the soul of hubris and uh, pompousness it just it's clean it's 
So I, I love going to the desert and what it does to my soul. Uh, so I love it there. But also, I, I, over the years, got to I got friendly with the people who started the sanctuary movement, which was a, an effort by uh, with the interfaith effort in southern Arizona to uh, help migrants who were coming into the U.S. during the civil wars in Central America um, as refugees, but being sent back, many of them to be killed. Um, and so these folks got started on uh, uh, smuggling them into the country, into the U.S., across the border, and then housing them in churches and temples all over the country. So they're an amazing group of people. So I got to know these folks, and then I started sending Stanford students down there meet them and get to know this whole world of, of work. Now the issue is, is the humanitarian problem of migrants crossing and dying at tremendous numbers from along the border with exposure and thirst and other problems and terrible things. So um, there's a wonderful community of people down there that I've gotten to know, and it's interfaith. And so I set the novel there, and Josh, his opening to the interfaith world comes through service and uh, service to the migrants and to, to this project to deal with the humanitarian problems, uh, putting water on the migrant trails, etc. So he gets involved in that. And that's how he meets a lot of the uh, religious people that he, that he uh, learns from. That, that's the story of this whole world. But part of this, part of the, part of the agenda, this was back to the point you made earlier, is to illustrate. The, the teenage kid in uh, you know the middle of nowhere, centrally located in the middle of nowhere in Arizona, can find within 100 or 120 miles uh, virtually all the world's faiths. Can find people living those faiths, even living in the most remote corner of the country. And that's part of the message of this book. If he could do it, you could do it. Our students talk about how they want their faith to be part of a solution to the world's great crises. They want to translate it into some kind of action. They're less interested in abstract religiosity and more interested in applied religiosity. So what does that mean for social justice? What advice would you give for young faith leaders who are intimately and intricately, inter in intimately and uh, uh, you know, intensively um, focused on translating their faith into some kind of social justice initiative? Well, I think that, um, um, Maybe an answer to that is a, is a story from Southern Arizona. So a young friend of mine, his name is Femora uh, <coughs> Staten, or Walt, he's also known as Walt. Young guy who uh, worked, he's part of this whole border justice community. And he uh, was not a religious person, no faith tradition, but very fiercely and strongly solid about trying to do something about the humanitarian mess on the border. Uh, long story, he got arrested for littering. Okay, what was his crime in littering? Putting water on trails in the Buenos Aires uh, uh, Wildlife Preserve run by the federal government. They threw the book at him and said, that's littering. What's, what's he doing? He's trying to save lives. You know? Anyway, it wound up national news and, and, a, and a big court case that went on for a couple of years because uh, he bought it. Finally, it won. Anyway, the whole process of that, and then living out in the desert in tents at 120 degrees for four years, he burned out. He just hit the wall and quit, dropped out of the work. And then he, after he took a break, he kind of reflected. And he goes, you know, the people who did not burn out, every single one of them, had a spiritual practice or a religious uh, commitment of some kind. Every last one of the people who stayed with him had some kind of spiritual path that they were on. And he was so blown away by that when he reflected on it that he went to seminary. <laughs> and he's now, uh, he's now a Unitarian pastor. Um, uh, gonna do, and he's back at work on the border again um, with the support of the Unitarian Church. So I just think that illustrates that, that, that you know, that, um, your spirituality can lead you into doing works of service, but we need to have a spiritual grounding in order to keep at it. So my advice to young uh, faithful people of whatever religion is, uh, who care about these issues is keep your faith, keep the faith. Uh, 
so that you'll have the juice, the energy, and the, um, um, the strength to uh, keep on walking the walk. Uh, I think it's a big deal. And it can be almost doesn't matter what the spiritual discipline is. It could be a whole bunch of different things. It's not specific to any one religion at all, um, or even a particular faith tradition, as long as there's some kind of a, a, commit to, a commitment to a practice. It seems to be what makes a difference. That's great. So let's open it up if there are questions or comments or observations from anyone. Yeah, conversation. <laughs> Yeah, uh, why'd you um, pick a male in 17 as your main character? Because I'm, I'm a boy. And, uh, and he's, you know, it is not autobiographical, not autobiographical at all, but, but um, I just wanted to, I think part of it, part of my commitment to that, um, to him as a, a male character, is that um, if you go to any church, synagogue, or temple, you will, you know, maybe not mosque, but pretty much everything else, it's women, 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 right? Mm. The overwhelming presence in the houses of worship in America are women. Uh, now, I love women. I, that's fine. I'm great. But, you know, I, I just wanted to really get it across that this can be an activity for men, too, because <laughs> they're a minority. In this case, it's a minority group. Uh, Josh, is, uh, he lives on the border. The border also runs right through him, so he's because he's half gringo and half Mexican. Mom's Mexican, dad is from the American white guy. So um, so he's he's got that kind of diversity built into him. And uh, then he struggles with it. He's, you know, he's, a confused, he's, he's struggling with his identity at, at a lot of levels. And uh, religious identity, he didn't even know. The, 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 the thing to know about the book is he, after all this soldiering, by the end of the book, we don't know where he's at as far as any commitment to a religion. He's very clearly committed to a path of service, and he's clearly focused on some kind of spiritual practice, but he hasn't signed up for religion yet at that point. And that's that's part of it. I did that on purpose to get people to, as part of the conversation starters. Like, okay, what's he, is he missing something by not doing that? So it leaves it open. It's like between a stone and a burner. <laughs> and that's a pun, too, because, you know, it's a German name. Uh, but uh, Stoneberg, you know, he, he lives in a copper mining town. So it's all about burning stones to get the copper out. Mm. And that, but uh, the idea is that he's trying to, he's going through a refining process. Mm. He's trying to cook out the gross and get to the, the good stuff. That's, that's, that's where the name comes from. That's what the name is about. That's the deceit of the name, or conceit, I should say. Great. What else? <clears throat> well, it's such an important um, idea to get this out there. Would you like to see it, like in book clubs and? Yeah, that's. I, I really. I, that, that's that's the goal. Is that this would be something used in groups a lot, yeah. and individuals, of course, but but uh, I would really really like to see it used that way. So classes, um, study groups, book clubs, etc. Yeah. Because it's so educational. You can never read the right book. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's got a, a study guide that goes with it. The idea here is that this is part of a larger um, um, uh, religious literacy effort. It's, I wrote the book in the interest of promoting religious literacy. Part of it, big part of it. So it's been, it's been published by a website devoted to that a company. It's a for-profit company called thefeos.com. And they're a, uh, I, would, I would just say, kind of a higher class version of religion, I mean, a belief gotten out. This is a bump up in terms of, shall we say, intellectual level. Uh, it's a very substantial website in terms of its resources. And they're very committed to, to really substantial interfaith. To, to religious literacy, building religious literacy in America and around the world. So I'm real happy to be connected to them. So the idea is that there's a website, there's a, a blog site at thefeos.com connected to the novel and uh, the religious literacy program encouraging people to be soldiers and then the study guide that goes with it. So it's, the idea is that this can be used as a supplement and uh, 
the curriculum. I was just thinking about that. What level would it be at? Because, you know, isn't it the Sable program that's there going out to high schools and you're talking about? Oh, that's, yeah, Carissa's thing, yeah. It could happen at high school. Oh, absolutely. It's, 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 how old is Stoneberry? He starts out at 14. He's writing at age 24, but it's, he starts out, the book starts with him at age 14. So it's, it, you know, it, 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 a savvy 14 year old. Uh, a, a precocious 14 year old could appreciate this book. That's why I think. Yeah. Yeah. It could be used, to, used for uh, yeah, young adults and teen uh, religious education, both in congregations and also in school settings. It could be used that way too. Is there a book movie on the cards? I'm sorry? A, 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 a movie? A movie? Uh, <laughs> you see you see play any? That's the good yeah, yeah. job. Used to do it to take care of I'm counting on <laughs> Reverend Hollywood is the nickname. It's actually, it could make a really interesting movie. It, oh, it's all right. I think it would be a good movie. Yeah. I think it's, 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 it's yeah. got the plot for yeah, it. Yeah. 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 But Tim? Yeah. Did you like going No, I think it, it, this, this would lend itself because there's a lot of yeah, visuals and comedy, too. It's, yeah. Crazy stuff happens. He has comic moments you know, where, where you just have to chuckle about religion and everything else. The, the key uh, character in the movie has been in the book, a little bit more here, um, <laughs> is a guy named Seedless Thompson. Seedless kind of ties the whole thing together. But it's, it's in the first person of, of Josh, but the, in a way the central character is this other guy who's a church janitor who reads all the books in the church library, all of them. And it's like the most literate, he's the most theologically literate person in the town. And uh, Josh, and he's nutty because he was a awkward, you know, a man with a tough life, living in a trailer. And um, anyway, Josh gloms onto this guy as his, kind of his, uh, his foil, and uh, also winds up having a very touching moment of redemption facilitates for the smart sequels. So, so it's, uh, the idea that it's, it's about, yeah, Seedless is a very important character. Other questions, comments? Were there any uh, religions really just kind of couldn't fit into the book because maybe the location or? Oh, the religions that didn't fit? Yeah, or? Yeah, oh, sure, oh gosh, yeah, oh, the Greek, yeah, it's, so this like, is just scratching the surface. Uh -huh. That's why I say I want the conversation started because then, and this is the thing, you know, that, that I, I try to make this real clear in the book via the novel format, where we're, the, the more Josh learns, the more bewildered he is. You know, the more he, places he visits, the more questions he has. You know, it, it's not like he uh, feels like he's any closer to the end of his soldier by the end of the book. <laughs> On the contrary, he's like this boggled by all this. Just you know, realizes he's got you know, it's, it's it's endless, it's endless. It's like it's like the copper mine, you know, the endless, bottomless pit. More to dig out. So it, it it just it invites you to keep going. The tip of you know, just the, the beginning of the episode. Where there's so much more to explore, even in his neighborhood. You know, he's aware of that. You know, even even in southern Arizona, there's a, if you keep keep digging and find more traditions to explore. So, yeah, that, that's America today. I mean, you get, you know, we have mosques in Tennessee, we have uh, uh, Buddhist temples in Georgia, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, things have changed. You know, Americans hardly caught up with the fact that we're so diverse religiously. Because the beginning, then, can we stay? Uh, George to go another question from age 24 to age 30. <laughs> ah, there you go. Trilogy, trilogy. Okay, cool. <laughs> I mean, it's like, this just took seven years. I mean, I mean, I, I, don't know, I don't know if I have it in me, but you know, it's, uh, I don't know. I haven't thought about that yet. But, uh, we'll see. We'll see what Josh inspires, you know, see how this thing, how this project, the project itself is what I got to put my energy into, both on campus, our version of but also out in the wider world, make use of the book and you know, leverage it for its purpose. And that's where my energy is going to go for a while.
Yeah. yeah. That's right. um, what would you recommend to perhaps like intimate audiences who maybe live in Las Vegas with their diverse societies? Uh, how would they go on their own children? Well, uh, you know, I'm sorry? Is it, would it be like an internal one? Like, I don't know. Well, virtual. Uh, but, but, you know, it's changing in the rest of the world, too. You know, you think of it, it's, it's uh, uh, this kind of diversity is expanding in other countries where it used to be you know, mono-religious. That's changing fast. And, uh, uh, so, yeah, this is becoming more possible abroad as well. As this, as this spreads, and you get a globalization, you know, movement of populations around the world. It's, the religious diversity is going to happen all over. I think. You know, we're just we're the pioneers of it. We really are the pioneers of this. Um, Warren and I host groups from around the, the, the world that come here to learn about um, uh, delegations. But this is through the State Department. So we have, we have Malaysians coming shortly. Uh, I'm <laughs> sorry. Uh, anyway, they come to learn about how America deals with us, how our institutions in this country cope with or make use of, you know, make or capitalize on this amazing religious diversity. And they're just fascinated by it. They, they're boggled by it. Uh, we just had a group of Egyptians here a few weeks ago, Egyptian clerics from uh, all of them. well, it's a uh, Coptic and Muslim, uh, some folks from Al Azhar, which is the greatest, you know, the big Muslim university in the you know, place of learning in Cairo. And, uh, and you could just see, you know, the look on their face, you know, their faces of just like, wow, all in one building, all this happening, you know, it's just, it is very impressive to them. Uh, to, you know, we've had people from Azerbaijan, and, <coughs> uh, Iraq. Where else? I can't remember. But, yeah, yeah. yeah, we've had a, a, many others from other, other places too before that. But but they're, they're just you know you get the sense of how they're they're waking up to how they need to do the same. You know what we're doing. They need to be ready to receive and to uh, to cope with religious diversity in their countries. Anything else? Thank you for maybe you want to take the final word here if there's any last thoughts uh, or yeah, comments yeah. about soldiering that you'd like to you know share. it's uh, um, um, I just I love writing this book and I just is so fun it's fun it's touching it's also a ton of work to write a novel particularly one that's researched like this one it's like everything has to fit together it's like a whole bunch of work to write I'm warning you. Do you have any pretensions to this type, type of activity? But um, but it's just been a very satisfying project. And, uh, I'm excited that uh, it could be useful to the cause because uh, you know it's one thing to I, I think this would be my parting comment. You know, it's, uh, you know respecting religious diversity, accommodating to it, honoring uh, difference. Etc. That's all right. Tolerance, wonderful. But there's this step beyond that, where you um, you try to um, appreciate and where, where you grow from a deep encounter, and you change. You make yourself, you, you offer yourself to be willing to grow and change, and uh, become something different than you were before. And and we, our country has this opportunity to be different as a country by not just tolerating religious diversity, but embracing it. And um, really drilling deep with it and uh, taking advantage of this fantastic opportunity we have to, uh, to have this kind of exposure. And, uh, uh, and to let that influence our institutions and, uh, um, and also influence our, uh, our attitude toward Faith itself. Um, what does it mean to be a Christian who embraces pluralism? Uh, that's a new, a new task for Christians. It's a new idea for Christians. I think Americans are catching on to it. They're turning on to that. But it's going to change Christianity. 
in America to do that. And, uh, but we're willing to change, and we're willing to adjust uh, for the sake of growth and, uh, and for uh, a better country and a better world. So I hope this book serves that step beyond tolerance and into embrace of, of, of this diversity. Yeah. Great. Well